right, welcome. Um, sorry for the delay. We have the honor of being one of the panels that was asked to, to be videoed, and it took a little while to get the equipment up. So welcome, this is um, session 6A on identity and memory, Huguenot, uh, Huguenots and conversos and other Francophone voyagers. Um, I am uh, Dina Goodman, I'm chairing the session, and um, I'm not commenting. Um, we decided that um, we have four papers. The speakers are gonna try to limit themselves to, um, because they really wanna maximize discussion. Um, and so, I have not prepared a comment, but if you need me to you know, get a question or two going at the, at, the, at the beginning, I'm happy to do that. All right. So just so our first speaker today um, is Gail Brunel. She is a professor of history uh, at Cal State Fullerton, um, and she is the author of books in two really very separate fields. She is the author first of the New World Merchants of Rouen, 1559 to 1630, um, and also of uh, more recently of a, uh, a book on Samuel de Champlain, Champlain, the founder of New France, that came out in 2012. But in between, she co-authored Murder in the Metro, Letitia Thoreau, and The Cagoule in the 1930s France. And her work goes back and forth between these two periods. Um, not surprisingly, for our session today, she will be talking about the 16th century and not the uh, 20, 20th century. Um, and this uh, paper today comes, uh, is related to a book she is working on, um, uh, which is a microhistory, a study of a merchant um, from Paris who spent 20 years in Toulouse during the French Wars of Religion. Um, so her talk today uh, is not on him, um, but it is called A la ruine totale de la France, a French assessment of Portuguese and Spanish immigration in 17th century France. Gail. Thank you, Dina. I'd like to uh, thank Dina for um, in, for her introduction and thank Laurie Weintraub for putting together this panel and a previous panel. And among the many um, potential disappointments here of my paper is there's not a Huguenot in it, okay? Um, even though these are the Huguenot panels. In the 16th century, several waves of Iberian immigrants, most of them merchants, and many of them of converso, or converted Jewish heritage, settled in France. Along with the Italians in France during the same period, the Iberians were responsible for importing and disseminating numerous commercial techniques and institutions that were central to the ability of French merchants to expand their commercial horizons. For example, the use of maritime insurance Insurance and the development of merchant tribunals to deal with commercial disputes. The Spanish immigrants of the early 16th century were joined in France by several waves of Portuguese immigrants from the late 16th through the mid 17th century. Because many of the latter were crypto Jews, in the eyes of the French, the religious orthodoxy of the entire Iberian community was suspect. The religious and ethnic identity of the new Christians, as the these descendants of converted Jews were entitled, has been the subject of intense scholarly disagreement almost since the beginning of their diaspora throughout the early modern world and continues to be debated to the present day. My focus in this paper, however, is not to join this debate about the true identity of the new Christians, at least in terms of their interiorized religious beliefs and or sense of membership in a larger diaspora of Iberian Jews or Hebrew nation. Rather, I want here to explore briefly a document that helps to elucidate how others, outsiders to their communities, understood new Christian identity. My interest, in other words, is the often paradoxical discourse about new Christians that circulated not only in Spain, but elsewhere in Europe, and in this case specifically, France. 
The document in question is, an anonym, is a letter an anonymous interlocutor wrote to Jean-Armand Duplessis, Cardinal Richelieu, chief minister to French King Louis XIII around 1635, warning the cardinal and his master about the dangers the new Christians living in French cities such as Rouen, Nantes, Paris, Bordeaux, and Bayonne posed to the security of France and the French crown. This letter to Cardinal Richelieu contains a discourse that insists upon the new Christians as potential agents of empire, rather than merely as refugees or renegades. A discourse that its author fully expected Richelieu would find plausible and convincing. The letter's author was clearly angling for Richelieu to hire him as a sort of consultant to help the Cardinal devise a policy with which to deal with the Portuguese in France. He was a polemicist, but that does not mean that the views he expressed did not reflect common attitudes and beliefs in, Fran in Spain and France alike regarding new Christians um, and that historians cannot find much of interest in his views. The letter posits that the wealth and business and political contacts the new Christians had accumulated in their exile could be harnessed in the service of empire, albeit, its author contends, the wrong empire, the Spanish one. The author of the letter insisted that the new Christian refugees in France were anything but innocuous to the realm from which they had fled and to the politics where they found to the polities where they found refuge. The tropes that fill this letter tell us very little about the conflicted and mutable identities of new Christians in early modern Europe, but suggest a great deal about, about why for new Christians, no matter how devout their outward practices and even inward acceptance of Catholic doctrine might be, their old Christian neighbors would never accept them as truly Christian in religion or truly loyal to the Christian rulers of the realms where they resided. Moreover, and this is a central issue for this paper, this seems to have been as much the case in France as it was in Spain or Portugal. The author of this letter claimed that his knowledge of the true nature and activities of the Spaniards, Portuguese, and Jews living in France derived from the letter's writer's own espionage. For nearly 30 years, he had lived in various places in the Spanish Empire under the false name of Diego de Peralta, a merchant supposedly from the Kingdom of Navarre in the Pyrenees on the border between France and Spain. Circulating within the Spanish Empire while engaged in his trade, Peralta had over the years enjoyed ample opportunity to observe the behavior and assess the morality of the Spanish Portuguese Jews and was now moved to write to Richelieu because he was alarmed that the Cardinal and the King, not realizing the danger, magnanimously permitted these vipers to reside in France. Peralta, the letter Peralta penned is filled with tropes about Jews, many of which will be familiar to modern readers. Love of luxury, hatred of Christian, against whom the Jews ceaselessly plot, dissimulation of their true nature and beliefs, cunning and treachery and manipulation of their wealth for political ends. It is true that Peralta was familiar enough with the new Christian communities in the Iberian world and France to understand a fundamental distinction that escaped many other French people. The Portuguese New Christians who migrated to France between about 1580 and 1640 were often actually Spanish Jews and were now fleeing Portugal to escape the Inquisition in that country. And the flow of Jewish refugees most forcibly converted to Christianity between 1480 and 1550 across the border separating Spain and Portugal meant that although an individual new Christian might speak both Spanish and Portuguese and regardless of on which side of the border that individual resided before leaving the Iberian Peninsula, the distinction between Spanish and Portuguese nationality was not that significant. The new Christians were all enmeshed in a network spread throughout the Spanish Empire and that link that empire to the rest of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, and Asia. Hence, Peralta lumped the Iberians in France all together as Spanish-Portuguese Jew, which he actually writes in his letter as one word.
But what interests me here is the insistence in this letter that these secret Iberian Jews were intrinsically political in their aims and that they were agents of the Spanish Empire laboring to destroy France even as they at the same time hoped to destroy all Christendom. Thus, at the letter's core is a bizarre paradox that Peralta does not even attempt to explain, and neither will I. The Spanish-Portuguese Jews in France are agents in the service of the empire from which they have supposedly fled and that persecuted them. The motivation for their perfidious betrayal of the realm, which has offered them refuge and welcome, is not love of homeland, but hatred of all Christians and Christian polities. The Iberians are the political enemies of France because they are the religious enemies of Christianity, even if undermining Christian France means bolstering the power of the equally Christian Spain. The issue here is not so much is not that the argument makes sense. Of course not. But that it underscores a firm belief that even as refugees, the Iberians were viewed as opportunists when it came to seeking any occasion to profit from Christians, even while biting the hand that fed them, but also that they were agents of empire with agency, with potency. The letter to Richelieu begins after Peralta has attempted to establish his correct credentials as someone in the know when it comes to Spain, its empire, and its Jews by explicating the tyranny of Spain and the dangers it poses to France. Peralta seems to be suggesting that the undesirable traits of Jews are communicable, like a, like a poison or a disease. He conflates the same traits of cunning, love of luxury, and treachery normally described to Jews as to all, to all Iberians in a strange echo of the Spanish ide ide ideology of limpieza de sangre, he seems to imply that the secret Jews among the Iberians have tainted all Iberians, even culturally converted them, so that all share indiscriminately character faults usually associated with Jews. In the ideology of many Spanish apologists for new Christians, such as the well-known 17th century figure Father Antonio de Vieira, the problem with obliging new Christian refugees to reside together with Jews in cities such as Amsterdam was that if the good Christians among the new Christians were obliged to live long enough among the Judaizing um, Jews, Jews practicing Judaism, they would inevitably begin to live as the Judaizers and eventually absorb and mimic Hebrew religious errors and moral perfidy if only to survive. For Peralta, by contrast, the arrow of, arrow of contamination seems to go the other way. The categories of Spanish, Portuguese, and Jews have ceased to be distinguishable at all. This helps to explain the paradox described above, that the new Christian refugees in France behave as agents of the Spanish Empire they have fled because the categories have been elided in the discourse. To be Iberian is to be Jewish, and to be Jewish or Iberian is to hate Catholic France and its king. How are the Spanish and Portuguese Jews undermining France? Here are the very real tensions and rivalries between the Iberian merchant communities in France and their French hosts emerge. The core of the letter is a diatribe against these foreign merchants, agents of Spanish imperial interests, who are undermining French commerce, stealing commercial opportunities from the French, even as they are using trade as a cover for espionage. At the heart of a right French writer's complaint lay what he considered the sharp practices of the Iberian merchants, both in the form of ruses to cheat French merchants and in a sort of clannishness that was typically imputed to Jews, but here is attributed to all Iberian merchants operating in France. And there's a great deal of evidence in the archives that I don't have time to get into here that shows this going on. But um, what we see here is similar to orientalizing strategies that Iberians are and Jews are conflated in some ways with the same love of luxury and selling of luxury to France that um, 
is also that Oriental um, discourses also, Orientalizing discourses also bring up. But Peralta saw more than mere com commercial competition and canny investments strategies in these practices. He says, the Spanish Portuguese Jews who labor ordinarily to betray and trick us and diminish the authority and power of the French monarchy through their evil maxims, unable to accomplish this by force, use us against ourselves through the hands and instructions of those who reside in all of the cities, principally Rouen and Paris. The Iberians sold needless luxuries, silk, pearls, dyewood, and exotic products, and by this means sucked wealth out of the out of France while weakening the moral fiber of the French as well. And when the French merchants tried to get payment for debts that they were owed them, they found that these Iberian Spanish Jews had sent all their money out of France or hidden it in other ways. The Iberians weren't simply out to enrich themselves, however. They were, Peralta alleged, spies. The liberty, quote unquote, to trade and move about freely in France that they enjoyed served only to accord them the liberty to know France, even the secret affairs of the king. And under the pretext of being bankers and, uh, and sellers of pearls and precious stones, the Spanish Portuguese Jews were able to send information and advice to the king of Spain, intelligence that the Spanish monarch could then use against his enemies. As evidence for his accusations, Peralta claimed that, quote, I resided with a Portuguese Jew who was taken by the Holy Office and who declared to the inquisitors that he had much correspondence in France for the service of the king of Spain via his correspondence and kins who had lived there for some time. France, Peralta alleged, would be safe from the espionage of such men only if the cardinal prevailed upon the king to banish entirely from the realm all Spanish Portuguese Jews. So in conclusion, what the letter analyzed here demonstrates is that tropes about Jewish perfidy, the impossibility of truly converting and or assimilating Jews, and many of the stereotypes associated with the ideology of Limpieza de Sangre in Spain circulated as well in France. The underlying assumption that all Iberians living outside of Spain and or engaged in commerce with, were new Christians was as commonplace in France as it was in Spain. And by the way, I have many other documents, particularly related to commercial disputes, where pieces of this discourse emerge. What I like about this letter is you see it all together in one place, but I've seen it elsewhere in France. And this helps to explain why a mercantile career was less desirable and honorable in early modern Spain and Portugal than it had been in the Middle Ages. By 1600, Iberians and their new European neighbors seem to have assumed that to be both Iberian and a merchant was to be a new Christian, and to be a new Christian was to be a Jew. It was no longer possible to separate in the discourse these conflated categories or for new Christians to escape from the discourse that had coalesced around them. Assimilation was no longer possible, even in France, because assimilation is a dialogue, not merely a choice, and both interlocutors in the dialogue must be able to believe in the possibility of assimilation. And apropos to our plenary session, I'd say an in integration as well. The documents analyzed here suggest that new Christian refugees did not have the option of assimilating, even if they were so inclined, even if they or their ancestors' conversion to Christianity was sincere, even if they had been raised as Catholics and knew little or nothing about Judaism, because in both the Iberian countries from which they had fled and in a host country like France, Christians subscribed to a discourse about new Christians that obviated the possibility of assimilation and fixed all Jews and all new Christians as a permanently hostile other. One hostile to Christians, and therefore hostile to Christian rulers, and willing to betray all such rulers equally. This discourse of permanent hostility was also, however, a discourse of a kind of agency, albeit one in which Jews and new Christians alike were inescapab inescapably 
agents of ruin to any polity, any Christian polity, where they resided or found refuge. Thank you.